pity that you have seen one of his ve his vehicle arrives on the night in question, um, and his vehicle is the one where the kids go to and they get in his car. And during the course of being in that in the car, um, Jer Jeremy or JT makes statements concerning who did it, um, identifying his father as a shooter. Um, he's in the car for about he's in the car for about 30 minutes and makes several statements that corroborate during the course of his video um, the time he's in the car. Nautic and Amber are also in the car with him at the time um, and they make statements as well as terms of being scared. They also identify their father as the shooter. Um, so it would be the state's contention to put Deputy Evans on next and play that video for the members of the jury in its entirety and I believe Mr. Brown wanted to be heard on. Yes sir, Mr. Yes, Brown. Yes, so, um, we be objecting particularly to the parts of Amber and Nautic being both PSA in violations of the Confrontation Clause. And they are talking about um, aspects of the crime and all. Of course, they have not testified previously. Right. And Mr. Waller, what's your position with respect to the hearsay and confrontation clause <laughs> objection? Your Honor, um, under, the, under the hearsay um, exceptions, I would offer these both as present sentence impression and excited utterance utterance as you can tell that from the video that's already been shown the girls run out of the house immediately as the um, as the officers arrive in regards to uh, I guess so any Crawford issues uh, Deputy Evans is there um, he is there for um, security reasons I would argue to you that these statements are not not testimonial in any nature they're um, not not for the purposes of preparing for um, trial or anything like that. They are pu purely the statements of the children um, right after this is right after this has happened. Um, I have a number of cases that I believe will, would support the proposition that they do qualify under the excited utterance um, excited utterance exception. One being State of North Carolina versus um, Timothy Bokowitz, B O C Z K O W S K I. And that's 130 NC app 702 um, state of North Carolina versus Perkins 345 NC 254 and state of North Carolina versus Pickens 346 NC 628 um, specifically in the Bakowitz case it makes one one that statement was up some 10 hours after um, the incident in qu incident in question um, and it also, this case and the others also outline um, when considering the spontaneity of statements made by young children, there is more flexibility concerning the length of time between the startling event and the making of the statements because the stress and spontaneity upon which the exception is based is often present longer periods of time than for children than, a, than adults. Um, I think these statements both clearly meet the uh, the, the test for um, the excited utterance being a, a, spontaneous, a spontaneous statement made it in a very short length of time after the event and also the concern that there's no um, opportunity for fabrication and in this case you will literally be able to watch the girls on on video and see that there's no influence made by Deputy Evans any other Wake County Sheriff's deputy or, or even their brother so for those reasons, I would allow, ask that you allow the video in whole, um, and in specifically in regards to JT's portion, I think it goes strongly towards cooperation. Let me look up.
falls within an exception to the hearsay rule and is therefore not offered for the truth of the matter. And, and in keeping with my, well, I'm not, I don't think, I think they are saying. Oh, I'm sorry, it is for the truth, but it falls within a. a well, I think that under the excited utterance. And I just I have not a chance to read all the case, but I, did, I was looking through Perkins. Um, I think that part of it is, it is a very fact-specific one, and I know um, Mr. Waller has <coughs> cited some, some facts with it and all. I think that they're probably, given the, the length of the statements and all, and, and all, I mean, I think that there probably needs to be more of a foundation l laid before a ruling can be done about that. I mean, we do know that, I think it's more that they're saying in Perkins simply that it happened right after a traumatic event and it's involving kids um, before the decision can happen, whether it's in fact an excited utterance. Um, I'd also argue that Perkins in particular, and I have not had a chance to read, look at the other cases, I, I know it is a 97 case, and of course we have the Crawford analysis as well, um, and exactly this is taking place in a police station, there are, the officer is there at first, not a police station, a police car, um, the officers that are involved in the setup and all. So we would argue that both apply, if it at all, that there needs to be, I think it's a very case-specific finding before. So I, th I, I, I think it may be appropriate to have some type of proffer first. Were, were the children's utterances in response to questions? They, I'm, some of them, but not, uh, Deputy Evans, I think, would say that they were in response, like, vehicle description, he immediately asked who did it, and Jeremy's actually, well, I think the girls do say um, my dad, but Jeremy also immediately says it was my dad, Nathan Holden. You've already heard the 911 call where Jeremy's on the phone, and originally he says um, it was some man that did it, and then the moment where he says it was my father, Nathan, is when he's in Jeremy Evans' um, patrol vehicle. And, and, and part of the whole problem we have is that Jeremy is mixed in there with not with Nautica and Amber, and if it was not, I mean, it would, we'd be talking about a very different issue if it was just Jeremy, but we, we are talking about two additional people who did not testify. Well, I think we probably ought to at least understand the context of it. I mean, another part of the analysis is whether there was an ongoing emergency that, that uh, I gather that this was very early in the investigation. The defendant wasn't in custody. Uh, the defendant wasn't in custody. Uh, Deputy Evans is the, the second car on scene. He was literally right behind Deputy Broadwell and Deputy Shapcott. And in fact, Deputy Evans and um, Deputy Broadwell, I think, were there at the same time. Right. I mean, it's you, you see the kids running out of the house immediately. Right. Right. And so it was in that time frame yes, where sir. there's still uncertainty as to who did it. Who did it? All right. Why don't we uh, have a, a brief voir dire to uh, understand the foundation and circumstances for this, and then we'll take it from there. Yes, sir. Um, State would call Deputy Evans to the stand for the purposes of this voir dire. Well. Sir, if you would, place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guys? I do. Thank you. Well. Deputy Evans, um, did you have the opportunity to respond to 1125 Lake Glad Road, Wendell, North Carolina on April 9th of 2014? Yes, sir, I did. And Deputy Evans, do you recall when you got the, the dispatch for that call? Uh, it was at 9.48 p.m. on that date. And when you received the dispatch, sir, did you know the, the nature of the call that you were responding to? Uh, we had originally got dispatched to, I believe it was a 9-1 hangover, if I'm not mistaken, but very soon after we had learned that it was responding to a shooting. 
And do you recall where exactly you were when you received that call, sir? Um, myself and one of the other deputies had just finished eating dinner, and we were leaving Nightdale at Nightdale Boulevard and Smithfield or First Avenue in Nightdale. And which deputy were you with, sir? Uh, deputy Pittman. Deputy J Pittman. Jeremy Pittman, correct. Jeremy Pittman. Um, and then how long did it take you to arrive to the dis to Lake Glad Road after you received the, the dispatch? I have my notes at 9.57 p.m. And Deputy Evans, when you got there, were there other Wake County Sheriff's deputies on scene at that point? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, who, what, who were those de deputies that were there on scene at that point? Um, Deputy Brawwell and Deputy Shapcott had just arrived, I, I would say approximately maybe one to two minutes ahead of us. Um, I heard them check 1023, which means on scene probably approximately a minute before we got there. Okay. So were they, were they still in their vehicles when you got there, if you recall? They... From my memory, I remember uh, they were already had exited their vehicle, and um, I remember I think I remember seeing Deputy Brawwell on the porch. I don't remember seeing Deputy Shapcott, but um, I do remember seeing Deputy Brawwell on the porch, and uh, Deputy Mackey I think was all, me myself, Deputy Mackey, and Deputy Pittman all arrived at the same time, pretty much. So, to you, the best of your recollection, Deputy Broadwell hadn't even entered the house when you when you arrived. I don't I don't know if he had been in yet or not. I just remember seeing him on the porch. I don't know if he'd actually entered the house yet or not. And that's when you said you arrived at 9:57. Is that right, sir? Yes, sir. All right. After you arrived there at 9:57, what did you do? Um, I exited my patrol car and started walking towards the house. At which time, Deputy Broadwell um, was coming off the porch with three three juveniles. So did you even make it into the house? No, sir, I never made it into the house. All right. When you saw those juveniles coming out of the house, can you describe for the court their general demeanor when you first saw them? Uh, ex the two girls were extremely upset, crying. Um, Jeremy was, he, he was visibly upset, but he was not crying. Um, I think, I, I, I rem specifically remember the girls being extremely upset, crying almost to the point of, Un, unstoppable crime and deputy evans when you when you saw the girls in that condition and jeremy upset as well did you at that point even know what was going on in the house i did not know and deputy evans at that point what what did you do with the girls and, and jt uh i brought them to the back of my patrol car and placed them in the all three of them in the back of my patrol car um and began asking them questions and Deputy Pittman was actually standing on the outside of my patrol car because at this point we didn't know um, where the suspect was, how many suspects there were, um, or if they were still on scene. So Deputy Pittman was behind me, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I believe he had his gun out just at a low ready, basically protecting us because while I was asking the girls questions. So this was still an ongoing scene at that point where you didn't even know where the suspect was. Correct, or how many suspects there were at that, time, at that point. And did you consider the scene at this point, I, I don't know, I guess a high-risk scene? At that point, yes, because nobody, by the time Deputy Broadwell brought, brought the children back to my vehicle, um, nobody had even been in the house yet to clear the house. And was there a specific reason why your patrol vehicle was chosen, Deputy Evans? Uh, just because Deputy Broadwell brought the girls straight to, to me, so I just placed them in my vehicle to secure them. And so it wasn't like your car had an in-car camera, is that right? Yes, sir, it did. But your your vehicle wasn't chosen just because it had an in-car camera? No, sir. I believe pretty much everybody on scene had an in-car camera okay. um, that was there. And do you have noted, sir, um, what time the, the kids actually got into your car? At 9.57 p.m. Okay, so within the same minute of your arrival time? Correct, yes, sir. And then you mentioned that you or you and or potentially um, Deputy Pittman asked them a few general questions about suspect description or whatnot. Correct. I did. Mainly my I did. Yes, okay. sir. And what did you ask? What did you ask the children? Um, to the best of my recollection from reviewing the video and what I remember, I asked them who did it um, and started. Finally, Jeremy, at first he was a little bit hesitant to tell me who it was, but it, after probably a few seconds, he finally, I asked him, I think, I believe I asked him twice, if I remember correctly, and he finally told me it was his dad, and I asked him his dad's name, and he told me Nathan Holden. And how about the girls at this time? Were you were you directly questioning Jeremy or the girls or just everybody in general? All three of them. I was asking him who did it, all three of them, because they were still all three in the back of my patrol car. Okay. 
And at, at this point, um, Deputy Evans, do you recall what, what the girls said as well? I don't remember exactly what they said. They were still very upset at this point. Um, I do remember them. They were so upset they didn't even realize I was a police officer. Um, I do remember them saying, don't call the police. Okay. And, and I'll, the girls were saying, don't call the police, and, and you're standing there, and you're, <clears throat> were you in your full uniform as yes, you sir. are here today? And, and did they say multiple times, don't call the police? Yes, sir. And multiple times, do you identify yourself as a police officer? Yes, sir. Okay, you mentioned you also, um, that you also asked about a, the vehicle uh, the vehicle that their <clears throat> dad yes, was sir. driving. Um, was who was able to give you a description of the vehicle? Uh, Jeremy was. Okay. And what time did he give you a vehicle description? Uh, at ten o one p.m. Okay. And did the girls were you questioning them about a vehicle description as well? In general, all three of them. Okay. But it was Jeremy who gave you the statement. Correct. Okay. And then at um ten o three, what what happens, Deputy Evans? Uh, Eastern Wake EMS arrived on scene. And then at what time um, does Jeremy stay in your car until a certain point? Um, Jeremy stayed, all three of them stayed in my vehicle until um, I believe Captain Broughton arrived on scene, which is our, at that time was our investigations captain. Um, he arrived on scene and stated we need to separate them just so Jeremy wouldn't be able to influence anything that they were say had said or anything of that nature. Um, so at that time, Jeremy was placed in Deputy Seda's car um, at 10:18 p.m. And so from 10:18 until uh, from 10:18 on, it's just the girls in the in your vehicle. Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. And what time? Um, how long does this video last? In terms of what time does it go off? <clears throat> I have it noted that I turned it off manually at 10:28. Um, at this time, Investigator Scheinberg had arrived on scene. Um, who was one of the juvenile investigators. And at that point, I, as far as I can remember from the time Jeremy got in Deputy Seda's car to the time Investigator Scheinberg and them arrived, I don't believe I asked him any additional questions that would be of importance to getting description out of a suspect description, vehicle description, right. things of that nature. And so from 1028 to... Uh, I'm sorry, from 10.18 to 10.28, when it's just the girls in the car, to the best of your recollection, you don't ask them any case-specific questions. Correct. And, and I viewed the video. I think during that time period, you do ask them if they want a teddy bear or a blanket or, mm -hmm. or things like that. And Deputy Evans, at, at that point, was your general. what was your general concern for the girls' welfare? Um, I do specific, specifically remember them saying um, they had said a couple times, they said, we're going to need to move to get away from our dad. We're going to need to move. Where can we move, move to? Um, they were extremely scared. I was trying to calm them down the entire time. They asked to play on my computer. They were asking to play games and stuff because they were obviously vis visibly upset. I think I had gotten them a blanket out of my car, and um, they were. I was trying to get them calmed down at this point enough where they would feel safe. And at, at 1028, you say you turned the, the video off. Was that... Why did you turn the video off? Uh, at this point, shortly after that, Investigator Schein or at this time, I think Investigator Scheinberg had arrived on scene, and at that point, we were turning the investigation over to them. And there was at that point, there was nothing else that I needed to video, um, or that I needed the video to still be running, um, because at that point, they, at that point, I knew they were going to interview the juveniles, and it was needed to be in a in a better setting than the back of my patrol car. And, and how long were the girls um, there at the scene in the back of your patrol car total? I would say pro approximately an hour, probably total. Um, I have in my notes that I arrived with them at the sheriff's office to get interviewed at 11.49 p.m. And Deputy Evans, during the entire interaction that you had with them from, uh, I guess, 9.57 until 11.49 p.m. did they stay in this uh, emotional condition that you've described here for the court they did and th from the time that you said jeremy left your car about 10 18 p.m. did he appear to be visibly upset at that time as well he was and, and deputy evans this the, the situation up until 
1149, was it still an ongoing investigation at that time um, with the suspect still still at large to your knowledge? To the best of my memory, I do. I, I actually turned my radio off when I was transporting them down to the sheriff's office. Um, at that point, I believe they had um, discovered Mr. Sylvester's body in the in the backyard and I, I cut my radio off just so they wouldn't hear any more of the radio traffic that was going on. So I'm not exactly sure. At that time, I, I still thought it was an active investigation. And this, um, have you had the opportunity to review the video prior to court today? Yes, sir. Does it fairly and accurately reflect the uh, the emotional state of the children that night and your activities and your, your questioning of them? Yes, sir. And it was maintained in a proper chain of custody with your, your vehicle and pursuant to Wake County Sheriff's Department policies. Yes, sir. Questions. Yes, uh, just a few questions. Yes, sir. So, to clarify, you were wearing your sheriff's uniform at the yes, time. Yes, sir. Exactly like I am right now. Okay. And at the time, um, the investigation, when you first got the girls, you were aware that Nate Holden had already been named as a suspect in the case, correct? I was the one named. Yes, sir. Okay. So, you knew that he was a suspect in the case by the time you started talking to the girls? They're, they're the ones that gave me the description, and I was the one that broadcasted it over the radio. Okay. So a lot of this questioning that came in, you weren't asking the girls questions about how to find Mr. Holden, right? I'm sorry, what was that? You weren't asking them questions about how to find Mr. Holden. I, I asked them for a, a description of who had committed the crime. Okay. And then I asked them for a description of the vehicle because there was other deputies, a large amount of deputies coming to the scene, and at that point, Obtaining further information, we knew he he had left the scene, so I was trying to give them a vehicle description so we could attempt to locate him. And that was at the very beginning of your talk with them? Uh, within probably the first, I'd say, five minutes or so. Okay. But after that, you went trying to find out specific information about where he might be? <sighs> I, yeah. Honestly, I'd have to review the video again. I, I don't remember specifically asking what questions I asked him after that. Um, I don't. So you may have been asking them questions that more about either what happened in the house that night? I don't specifically remember asking them any, any questions other than, to the best of my recollection, any other questions other than the suspect description and vehicle description, to the best of my knowledge. But this was a 40-minute time that you had with them, right? Well, I was in and out of the car. Okay. Um, we, were, we had, there was, there's times in the video in which I'm not in the vehicle with them, um, they're, they're in there amongst themselves, the three of them, because at that point, it was still an active scene. We were trying to set up crime scene tape, start a crime scene log. Um, there were several other deputies arriving. The property, obviously, as you've seen before, is, is a pretty big property. We were still, they were still searching the exterior perimeter of the, the property. Let me ask you this. It's fair to say you don't remember every question that you asked them. I know this is three years ago. No, sir, I okay. don't. So there's some... So it's, you're doing your best to try to remember what you specifically asked them. Correct. Yes, sir. But you don't remember every question that you asked them. No, you don't sir. remember every topic that you covered. No, sir, I don't. And some of them may have been things involving specifics of what happened in the house that night. I, have... I don't remember asking them any line of questions like that. I mean, I don't recall. What are, if you know of questions like that, let's get to the heart of it. Because I need—I actually a, don't remember the specifics of I, everything. I need to make an evidentiary yes. ruling about questions that he asked, not what he remembers. About well, and, and partly the point I'm trying to make is we're trying to make that ruling without him, know, without us knowing specifically what he says. And well, I, I'm and assuming I, that, that you all have reviewed. I it have reviewed the video. I have to say that it's been. The, it's been over a year since I have reviewed it and part of everything and all. But I, think, I believe there are questions in there that could be, and that's the point I was trying to make about it. All right, it. so do you have a specific, I mean, certainly, I can tell you right now that certainly portions of the questions at the early stage of, the, of who did this and what's the vehicle, what's he look like, those are non-testimonial. This, right. I, I'm 
certainly going to find that this is an a, uh, uh, ongoing emergency and it yes. falls outside of Crawford on that basis. And I'm also going to find that their excited us utterances or present sense impressions. Now, if further into the interview there are questions like you're talking about, then you should bring them to my attention because that may be a different yes. analysis. But I mean, if we're talking about the forecast of the evidence that that he recalls, then I think it's admissible. Now, again, I think it's your duty to point out something that you think should be redacted, and, and I'm, I don't think we should rely on his memory of what he asked okay. to, to make your objection. All right. Well, I have. I may have one second. I don't, I don't have any more specific comments. All right, and as when we have, have the video being played, if something, if there's a question that you believe we need to pause the video and take up again, then obviously it's an, it's an important objection and it's a constitutional yes. issue at play. So I'm not, I'm not trying to cut you off, but I, okay. don't, I just don't think it's very helpful to the court for him to speculate as to sure. what questions he might have asked in the interview when we need to be rather specific here. All right, uh, so what I'm gonna find with respect to what I've heard in the forecast of the evidence, uh, that I'm gonna rule that the statements made in the presence of Deputy Evans and recorded by video were uh, not testimonial statements as that term is used uh, in the Crawford case and its progeny, but rather were made in the course uh, where the circumstances objectively indicate that the primary purpose of the interrogation was to enable police assistance to meet an ongoing emergency. I would find that at the time these statements were made, the perpetrator was at large, his location was unknown, he was potentially a continuing threat, there was a firearm involved, the perpetrator was believed to be armed. The location of the crime was at that stage unsecured. Uh, it was a large area and with uh, lots of potential places for a perpetrator to hide. Uh, the victims involved were uh, killed or seriously injury, injured. These statements were made close in time to the, uh, to the assaults. Uh, these victims at least one of them, well, all three could be heard in the call for assistance. Uh, so these children were all involved in the call for assistance on the 911 call. Uh, and uh, these, uh, these three children were all in an agitated and upset and emotional state. Uh, the information that was secured all is that which would re reasonably use to meet an ongoing emergency, the description of the suspect, the identity of the suspect, the description of the vehicle, and where he lived and might otherwise be found. All of those are reasonable questions to meet an ongoing emergency through police questioning. So for all of those reasons, I would find that uh, these are non-testimonial statements. With respect to the hearsay analysis, I would find that these do fall within the hearsay ex exception of present sense impression and or excited utterances, and so they would be admissible under the evidentiary rules as well. So the objection uh, as it stands right now would be uh, overruled. Uh, we will listen to the questions very carefully as the tape is being played, and if you have any further objection to specific questions, make that known to the court and we'll consider this analysis further. Um, the only other question that I have, also knowing all the questions based on what we said beforehand, but is also where the videotape is going to be played. And Okay, that, that would be my preference rather than on this play.
All right, very good. Let's uh, bring the jurors Let's, in. Um, it, Your Honor, I, it's, with the time being it as is, the video is 40 minutes long. I don't think we can do it uninterrupted. Deputy Evans, are you available tomorrow? Yes, sir. We have a witness that's not available tomorrow, so if we can All right. switch those out. Well, in that case, let me ask counsel for the defense to review the video and bring any specific objections to me first thing in the morning, and that way we can do it in a, in a uh, more organized fashion in front of the jury. Yeah. All right, very good. Not a problem. All right, so you can stand up. Thank you. need to take up with counsel outside the presence of the jury, so I apologize for keeping you waiting after we return from that recess. Uh, I believe uh, we're ready for the state to call further witness. Yes, Your Honor. This time we'll call um, Heather Barber to the stand. Deputy Heather Barber. <coughs> Yes, sir, Mr. Wally. Thank you. Uh, Investigator Barber, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Will you please state your name for us? Investigator Heather Barber, the Wake County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been with the Wake County Sheriff's Office? <coughs> Fifteen years. Fifteen years. And I've called you an investigator. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what division you are an investigator with, ma'am? Sure. I work with the uh, Juvenile Investigation Division, or a Juvenile Investigator. And back on April 10th of 2014, were you an investigator in the juvenile um, department of Wake County Sheriff's Department? I was not. I was um, assigned to the Criminal Investigative Division. I was a property crimes investigator. And I think we've heard the term CID earlier. Is that same CID? thing? Mm -hmm. CID is your investigative division. Yes. Um, but as that uh, investigator Dreamus testified to earlier, sometimes detectives help with other. Uh, other departments when a big case happens is that right right if you're in an on-call position which is what I was um, on the 11th which is when I responded um, if you're in an on-call position then you basically respond to any call you're needed on all right and let me turn let me turn your attention to that investigator Barber um, do you do you recall responding on Thursday April 10th or the 11th the 11th. I didn't respond to anything, um, the initial crime scene um, or Holden Acres. I didn't respond to anything on the 10th. Okay. And, and what, for what purpose did you respond to uh, Lake Glad Road and Holden Acres to on the uh, April 11th? So on, um, on the 11th, I received a call from a supervisor that asked me to respond to do perform a secondary search. Myself and my on-call group um, of investigators responded to do a secondary search uh, first of the Leglad Road um, residents, and then 
After that, we went to the Holden Acres residence also to perform, perform a secondary search. And, and I've called you an investigator, and I sometimes use the word detective. Are they it's much, fine. It's interchangeable. Pretty much synonymous. Okay. Yes. When you say a secondary search, what, what do you mean by that? So immediately after um, receiving the, the call, you do a primary search. Um, any evidence that is found, you know, for, of course, CCBI will process that scene. Typically, we'll take things, um, you know, into custody. And then um, you always follow it up with a secondary search to make sure nothing is missed. And usually there will be a third search also performed. Let's, um, we'll turn specifically to, to the Lake Glad search first. And sure. Well, what time of day did you do that, ma'am? Uh, if I recall, it was approximately 9, 30, 10 o'clock in the morning. Okay. And were you by yourself doing this, this search? No, there were several other investigators that um, assisted with the search. Um, I've got investigator Leffingwell, myself, investigator N Norton, and investigator Gerganus. And during the course of that search, investigator, what, what are you looking for in terms of evident, items of evidentiary value at that point? Um, anything that may pertain specifically to the crime scene, um, any shell casings, um, cell phones, again, anything that may relate to the crime scene or the crime specifically. Um, Anything that we may think may relate to it, not specifically used or that pertains to the crime scene, but anything that may be relevant. And do you do a search both of the inside of the house and the exterior at that point, or is it just the inside? Um, no, exterior and interior. Okay. All right, specifically in regards to the Lake Glad, um, Lake Glad uh, residents, can you tell us a little bit about your search there, ma'am? What items, first of all, that you took into evidence? Sure. Um, so what I'll do is just read specifically, sure. if that's okay with you. Yes, ma'am. Um, we found a white and silver Samsung Galaxy S3 cell phone uh, with a partial hot pink casing on the back of the phone. There was a picture of a black female subject, approximately 28 to 35 years of age, on the screensaver. Uh, 17 missed calls as of 8.51 hours on 4.10.14. Phone was located on top of a wooden desk located in the secondary bedroom. The room was filled with children's toys and clothes and also women's clothing, clothing and other items. There was blood on several of the toys and other items in this bedroom. And the picture of the black female su subject, do you now know who that black female subject is? Um, to be completely honest with you, I do not. That's fine. I don't recall. Right. And what was the second item that you, you took there from Lake Glad? A gray, black, and silver Verizon LG cell phone found inside a black and white pattern purse located on the bed in the master bedroom. Uh, there were two phone numbers written on cutout notebook paper and taped to the back of the phone. The numbers were 919-616-7587 and 919-333-0837. O eight three seven and the word M O M A. Um, and those two were the items that you took into evidence there on that secondary search. Were there other items that you also noted there on the search, but did not did not necessarily place into evidence? Yes, um, we actually contacted our captain, uh, Captain Eichert, and he said basically to just note them, but don't put them in evidence. Um, there was a federal name brand value pack, a 22 caliber long rifle ammunition found in a third drawer of a wooden dresser on the exterior wall of the master bedroom. Next. The Remington 20 gauge shotgun shells found in the fourth drawer of a wooden dresser on the exterior wall of the master bedroom. Magtech 380 caliber automatic bullets, CCI 22 caliber long rifle ammunition Remington Express 12 gauge shotgun shells, Remington Express 12 gauge buckshot shells. These items were located in the fifth drawer of a wooden dresser on the exterior wall of the master bedroom. There were 13 rounds left out of 20 of the Magtech 380 caliber bullets. Okay. Uh, one $100 bill and one $20 bill lying together on the bed in the master bedroom one small sealable plastic storage bag 
containing one broken medium-sized white pill, one small sealable plastic storage bag containing a, a quarter of a white pill, one medium-sized yellow pill with large V's on both sides, and one aquamarine colored capsule with TL386 on both parts of the capsule. One medium sealable plastic storage bag containing a green notepad with religious writing on the same. There was also a Lowe's home improvement receipt in the bag. One medium sized white envelope containing $12 in cash, $1 in quarters, and $10 in a tan sealed tithe, envelope, tithe and offerings envelope. The tan envelope was not opened. There was $10 written on the front of the envelope. Now, Investigator Barber, the third thing, or the second and third things <coughs> that you described there were um, shotgun shells, bullets, ammunition, um, buckshot shells, and more bullets. Mm -hmm. To be clear, ma'am, um, those were all bullets or ammunition that you found during that secondary search. Is that right? Yes. And this again, this is at the Lake Glad, um, Lake Glad home of Angelie and Sylvester Taylor. Yes. Uh, at any point during your search of that residence on April 11th, did you find any weapons or firearms? No. Okay. And did you do a thorough thorough search of the inside of that home and on April 11th? Yes, interior and exterior. It appeared um, that those shells, uh, those rounds, belonged to the homeowners okay. as and, their location in drawers. And then when you went to the exterior and did your search out, out there, again, did you find any um, firearms on the property at that point? No. And did there some sheds and uh, out on the property? Did y'all search those as well? We, we searched the sheds, the vehicles, we searched everything. Okay. And no firearms were located by you or, or your team at this point? No. Okay. Now, going to um, the Holden Acres search, <clears throat> did you do that Holden Acres search there on, on the same day? We did, immediately after. Immediately after. And how long did it take you to get to the Holden Acres residence? Um, maybe eight to ten minutes. So they're, they're pretty close to each other. Yes, they're both window addresses. They're not far. And if I may approach the witness at this time, Your Honor. Yes. And as I'm doing that, Investigator Barber, since we're running a little low on time, I'll ask you a few more questions. Um, the team that went to the Holden Acres um, location is, went to the... Um, Lake Lab location. Um, let me verify. I think so we had the addition of um, Sergeant Jerema um, in this search. She is now Lieutenant Averett with our agency. Um, but yes, the, the investigators were the same. And, and on April 11th of, um, 2014, by that time, had that <coughs> residence been identified as the residence where the defendant was staying? It had. And so that was the purpose of that search was to search the defendant's residence as well. Yes. And did y'all have a proper search warrant to do that on, on this day? Absolutely. I want to show you several items of evidence that, that I believe you collected that day. Um, Starting off with State's Exhibit Number 79, I apologize, Madam Clerk, I'm going to go out of order just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Can you identify State's Exhibit 79 for us? Yes. What, is, what has been marked as State's Exhibit Number 79? That is a clean bore gun cleaning kit with related contents found in a box on the left side of the bed in the master bedroom at Holden Acres. And is there a certain caliber that gun or pistol or rifle that this is a gun cleaning kit for, if you know? Mm.
it's gonna be a handgun. I know that because I, I have one also, but um, I cannot say for sure. But you do know it to be a handgun. I do a handgun gun, mm -hmm, gun cleaning kit. Yes. And does that? It's in a clear plastic bag at this time with identifying marks on it. But does that gun cleaning kit appear to be in the same or substantially same condition as when you collected? Yes. Any changes or alterations? Absolutely not. And there's some Wake County Sheriff's um, Office labels on this, including a case number of 14009962. Um, is it your understanding that's the case, Wake County Sheriff's number for this case? It is. Those are our evidence tags. Your Honor, this time I would ask to introduce the state's exhibit number 79. Any objection? No, Your Honor. It's allowed. <clears throat> And states exhibit 80, again, packaged in a similar way with the Wake County Sheriff's um, case number 14-00962. Can you identify what the item is in that, in that plastic bag? This is a black ace case shoulder holster with attached magazine case. The holster is for a 380 caliber handgun. The item was located in the second drawer of a green and clear plastic stand in the master bedroom closet. And you said that is for a 380. Um, is that a handgun? Is a handgun. And again, Investigator Barber, does that? I appear to be in the same or substantially same condition as when you collected it back on April 11th of 2014. Yes. Any changes or alterations? No. And again, it has the Wake County Sheriff's Office identifying information on it. It does. Your Honor, this time I would ask to introduce State's Exhibit 80 into evidence. Any objection? No, no. It's allowed. Now, during the search of the residence, um, Investigator Barber, did, did you also locate some currency? Yes. Okay, and can you tell us um, where you loca located that currency? Let me just find the entry if you'll give me just a second. <clears throat> okay. So we located $955 in cash. It was um, in the amount $50 bills, $20 bills, $10 bills, and $5 bills. They were located in the left pocket of a black portfolio found on the bottom shelf of a nightstand in the master bedroom. The money had the odor of marijuana. And I want to show you what has been marked for identification purposes as states exhibit number, exhibits <coughs> number 77 and 78. Mm -hmm. I'll ask if you recognize those photographs. I do. I took those photos. And what are those photos depict? Um, it's the black portfolio that we located um, <clears throat> at the residence on Holden Acres, the same of the second picture. Um, this is the original form we found it in with the money tucked inside the left side of the portfolio. Um, it's laying on um, Mr. Holden's bed, which is a purple comforter or a bedspread. Um, we took it out and spread it so you can see the bills, um, and that's the whole portfolio with the, the bills. And so states, uh, exhibits number 78 and, and 77, uh, do they fairly and accurately represent that? The way, the condition in which you found that money? Yes. Your Honor, this time I would ask to introduce 78 and 77 for illustrative purposes. Uh, any objection? No objection. All right, they're allowed. Nine ninety-five. Oh, sorry. The, the photographs are two photographs, seventy-seven and seventy-eight. And you mentioned, Investigator Barber, that there was an odor of marijuana about that cash. Did cash you find <coughs> any marijuana residue or anything like that on the, on the money itself? Not that I can recall. And during the course, you identified this as Mr. Holden's bed. During the course of your search, do you, some, do you collect different um, items of evidence that, that help identify who 
um, a, a room or a house belongs to. Yes. Okay. And can you tell us a little bit about what, what different items you collected there on that day to help you with the, I guess, the identification process of that, that house there at Holden Acres? Sure. Um, so we collect items of ownership of a residence or um, usually we try to collect a bill showing that somebody pays um, utilities or something like that. So in this case, we collected a bill with the name Nathan Holder and an address of 3536 Holden Acres Road on same. The item was found in a black decorative box on the right side of the bed in the master bedroom. Um, the box is covered with colored circles. We also found a business card for Nathan Holden, professional barber and fresh cut bar fresh start barber and beauty shop printed on same. The card was located in the second drawer of a green and clear plastic stand in the master bedroom closet. And were those were those items collected in the same room that you collected the the gun cleaning kit, the holster and the money? Yes. And did you also, during the course of your search, um, seize photographs that appeared to, to depict the defendant, Nathan Holden? Yes. We um, found a picture of Nathan Holden wearing a red do-rag, holding a small juvenile female. Um, <coughs> we also um, found a picture of Nathan Holden wearing a red do-rag, standing with a black female that looks to be in her 30s. And at this time, um, Investigator Barber, did you collect any weapons or firearms from the uh, Lake, excuse me, the Holden Acres address at that point? Um, let's see. We did not. Thank you, Investigator Barber. I don't have any further questions. Cross-examination. Yes, Thank you. <clears throat> uh, hi, Investigator Barber. Hi. So your, the first search your team conducted was at Lake Lad Road, is that right? Yes, ma'am. And you said that, that one, of the, one of the items, one of the types of items that you would be tasked with looking for would be um, items of obvious significance to the crime, is that right? Sure. So for instance, shell casings. Mm -hmm. And did your team locate any shell casings? No, those were located by the first search team. Okay, but but if you had seen any additional shell casings, you would have collected them, certainly. Um, we probably would have called for CCBI okay. to come out and process, take photographs, stuff of that nature. Okay. Right, you wouldn't have left them lying on, lying Absolutely uncollected, not. right? Okay. Um, uh, may I approach, Your Honor? Yes. So the um, the second the second scene that you searched was the Holden Acres residence. Is that right? Right. Actually, the the first place um, we went was when you go to Holden Acres. Um, there's a field behind the residence, mm -hmm. um, or down the path where um, the suspect was apprehended. Uh huh. Um, and so we actually searched the field to make sure there was no shell casings in that field. Uh -huh. um, and so we were not able to locate any more shell casings in that field. We proceeded from there to um, Mr. Holden's residence. Um, okay, so, so you didn't collect any shell casings in the field? No, it had already been searched. Okay, and you didn't locate any bullet fragments in that field either, I assume. Uh, we weren't looking for bullet fragments. Those would They're, be very difficult to find. Is they right? would. They probably would be buried in the field also. Okay. And let me go back actually first to the Lake Lad Road uh, scene for a moment. Um, your search, the search you talked about at least, was of the actual residence itself, the home. Is that right? Um, it was of the home and the cartilage. Did you search uh, there are a number of outbuildings that we've seen in photographs and diagrams. Have, did you search any of those outbuildings? We searched all the outbuildings. We searched vehicles. We searched everything. We searched the interior and exterior of the home and the curtilage. Okay. Um, may I approach, Your Honor? Yes. So I'm handing you first what's marked as, uh, just for identification purposes as Defense Exhibit 2. Do you recognize this? 
Um, you have your report in front of you of the items that were collected from the um, Holden Acres scene, is that correct? Mm -hmm, I do. Do you see on that list a, a green binder? It might be the last item. So what I have written on my um, evidence supplement, it says home management binder. This is our family binder. If you look on the, on the, uh, on the binding, on the edge of the binder, does it say the words home management? Yeah, it says home, well, home management binder. This is just home management. So let me see what the first says. I recognize that as my supervisor's handwriting now. Uh, can you do my reading that at the entry in your report as to what how, how you described that in your report? Uh, a three a green three ring binder with a piece of paper in the front sleeve that read that read home management binder. The binder was located on the bottom shelf of the nightstand in the master bedroom. Thank you. And that, and that, that, that defense exhibit two that you are holding is that binder. Is that right? Um, I would think so. It doesn't read, and I'm not sure exactly why that is, it doesn't, the sleeve doesn't read as, and it could be my mistake, but it doesn't read as I've written, the okay. front sleeve. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to hand you Defense Exhibit 3. Mm -hmm. You want to take a look at that, if that's something you recognize? Two black spiral notebooks containing a letter to Tanya and various lists. The notebooks were located on the bottom shelf of a nightstand on the right side of the bed in the master bedroom. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and for clarification, this is marked as Defense Exhibit 3 for identification purposes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Hamburger, we're in a break for the afternoon now and resume tomorrow morning at 9.30. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen of the jury, please recall the instructions. Don't talk about this case among yourselves or with anyone else. Don't form or express opinions about the outcome. No media or independent investigation in these matters and no conversations with parties, witnesses, or lawyers uh, gather at 9.30 in the deliberation room tomorrow morning. Thank you very much for your service. Leave your notepads in your chairs. Ms. Hamburger has any other questions if we can release this witness. If is that, that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Okay. Well, members of the jury, uh, thank you. Any, any redirect? Nope. All right, ma'am, you may step down. Thank okay, you. thank you.